In the late 70s, one of the most influential bands of the rock and roll era was convinced that the world was falling apart. Uh, it was an apocalypse. They wrote a song that may be the greatest lead-off track from a classic album ever. Song one, side one, for sure. Started with a conversation in a taxi between the front man and his fiance. They were talking about the state of the world. She convinced him that this conversation, he should turn it into a song. And he actually pulled the main layers from the front page of a newspaper. And between him uh, mimicking a seagull and then creating a Morse code sound with his guitar, he wrote a song that still levels the competition all these years later. The story, very cool one, is coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Now, if you used to skate to your favorite songs at the roller rink back in the day, you are gonna love this daily dose of nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe right now below so you never miss out on the stories of the songs straight from the legends. And we also have a Patreon, the link is below. Take a look at our content there. While helping our mission of curating this music history, very important. By the way, that intro came from our viewer, Risuki. This is London Calling in the overseas service of the British Broadcasting Corporation. This is London Calling, the identification introducing shortwave radio broadcasts uh, transmitted by the BBC during World War II with post-war programming that advanced well into the 1980s. Uh, when John Graham Miller, better known as Joe Strummer, was a 14-year-old lad, he spent some time in Africa uh, with his father, who was a British Foreign Service diplomat. His mother is, was there as well. She was a nurse. Now, in the middle of one hot African night, uh, young Joe was turning the dial um, on his father's shortwave radio, apparently. He was frantically trying to find s the sounds of his uh, British homeland. When all of a sudden, to his amazement, he tuned into the static reception of a UK singles chart countdown show. It was the first time that Joe Strummer recalled listening to a broadcast from the BBC World Service and uh, hearing the official identification that kicked off every BBC program. This is London Calling. Now, the ID rang resoundingly in Joe's childhood memory, and it would prove to be a major influence in his emergence as a punk oracle and a BBC radio personality. Now, before the world was introduced to the name Joe Strummer, the future icon actually played rhythm guitar in a pub act that uh, came together in 1974. Uh, they called themselves uh, the 101ers. Now, during his two-year stint with the 101ers, uh, Joe went by his original stage name, which is Woody Miller. By the time the clash formed in 1976, uh, Joe ditched Woody in favor of his new stage moniker, Joe Strummer. This was a reference to his uh, days of strumming a ukulele in the London Underground, a Metro London's rapid transit system nicknamed the Tube. The clash immersed into London's inner circle of punk, along with acts like uh, Sex Pistols, the, queen. She ain't no human being. the Damned, The Jam, and 999. Strummer recalled how he and his bandmates put in endless hours of what he termed Stalinist dedication to become a tight performing unit and to establish a distinct identity that would separate them from the pack. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Joe Strummer was a news junkie. Uh, he had ravenous interest in uh, learning about topical events in every newspaper and magazine that he could find or get his hands on. In fact, uh, the impetus for many of the songs that Joe wrote were from news articles that he had read. The most prolific example of Strummer's obsession for current events reporting can be found in the lyrics he penned for a London Calling. London calling to the faraway town. The title track for The Clash's epic third studio double album. Now, as we go into this song breakdown, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, that helps to make this possible. It's a brand that I always wear. They truly live up to their slogan, you know, eyewear for everyone. At zenny.com, you can shop by color or the shape of your face. There are now summer styles you can choose from, and you can personalize them or have them engraved like I have. Check it out at zenny.com today. Sun's zooming in, in 
to stop running. The wheat is going to. So the encouragement for Joe to write the lyrics for London Calling uh, came from his former fiance, Gabby Salter, while the two, uh, I guess, were riding in a taxi. Their destination w was a flat uh, located in a district of Chelsea, uh, London, in a sector fittingly given the name The World's End. During the cab ride, the couple were, you know, I guess, having a lively conversation about uh, many disturbing issues of the day, you know, the perpetual Cold War scare, and uh, how London was susceptible to a devastating flood. Gabby listened to Joe's grumbling editorial and pushed him to write a song about the issues that had him so overtly panicked. Uh, Joe began writing down his feelings and uh, arbitrarily listed all the matters that agitated him. Now, the original lyrics for London Calling included random verbiage that didn't make the cut for the prose that was featured in the recording. Uh, for example, the USA is shrinking, the world is shrinking, the sun is blinking while I'm drinking, the oil stops flowing, the what stops growing, the world stops knowing. Uh, the original discarded handwritten lyrics by Strummer are actually published in uh, the London Calling Scrapbook. This is a 120-page hardback companion to the album that includes uh, lyric notes and other exclusive memorabilia. I got this for Christmas a couple of years back. Uh, in fact, we'll link to uh, to it below if you want to own it for yourself. Joe Strummer opted for the final version of London Calling to focus uh, criticism and commentary on specific events and pressing issues after absorbing 10 news reports in a single day reported in the London Evening Standard uh, about various plagues potentially coming down on the mother country. On that particular evening, the Standard, which was uh, London's leading publication for foreign news, they ran a headline that read, the North Sea may rise and push up the Thames, flooding the city. The heading was the front page article in an issue full of doomsday journalism. I mean, let's face it, uh, the media is just rampant with fear inducement. But during the late 1970s, there were some very troubling environmental and man-made problems that uh, understandably shook Joe Strummer to the bone, many of which were captured in London Calling. You know, the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union had the the public constantly on edge about the imminent threat of nuclear war it was an underlining theme in many of the punk and post-punk recordings of the 70s going into the 80s. Verse 1 in London Calling expresses the grave worry about atomic bombs being dropped on the city. London calling to the faraway towns, now war is declared. And battle come down. Uh, more than 30 years after World War II, London was still recovering from the blitz by German bombers that happened in 40 and 41. Uh, and the lasting images of British children seeking refuge uh, from the air raids were vividly recreated also in verse 1. London calling to the underworld, come out of the cupboard, you boys and girls. To the underworld, come out of the cupboard, you boys and girls. There was the embarrassing accident at Three Mile Island that was in March of 1979 near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where a nuclear reactor had a partial meltdown, caused a dangerous radiation leak that could have been catastrophic. Strummer referenced Three Mile Island in London Calling with the line, a nuclear error, but I have no fear. In the song's chorus, it is going to be a nuclear error, but I have no fear. He also speaks of global warming and the shrinking ozone layer. Uh, also in the chorus, uh, the ice age is coming, the sun's zooming in. The ice age is coming, the sun's zooming in. Meltdown expected. The concern over the brutality exerted use of truncheons or billy clubs by the London Metropolitan Police. That's mentioned at the end of the first stanza. We ain't got no swing except for the ring of the truncheon thing. We got no swing except for the ring. The Joe also addressed the effects of drug use. We ain't got no high except for that one with the yellowy eyes. Got no high except for that one with the yellowy eyes. That passage was also a subtle reference to Strummer's brush with hepatitis in 1978. Going back to the alarming headline declaring that central London was going to be underwater, Strummer wrote about the predicted flooding of the River Thames or uh, the river uh, Isis, as it's called by some, because London is drowning and I, I live by the river. Is and I live by the river. 
Joe's vigilant uh, lyric actually helped spearhead the construction of the Tom's Barrier in 82. The Tom's Barrier is a retractable barrier system designed to protect Greater London from being flooded by high tides and uh, story surges from the powerful North Sea. When Strummer wrote London Calling, he actually lived by a river, but uh, in a high-rise apartment. Dismayed about how the public often turns to pop music to make them feel better about unsettling world events, Strummer and his bandmates were adamant about not becoming what they uh, called false idols for people looking for escapism. Joe made that ideology uh, very clear in one of the most memorable parts of the song's powerful opening verse. London Calling, Now Don't Look at Us, Phony Beatlemania has bitten the dust. Us, phony Beatlemania has bitten the dust. The mention of Beatlemania was actually not a shot at the Beatles, as many assumed. It was actually intended to be an indictment against the copycat bands that were prevalent in London during the late 1970s, including Beatlemania, a Broadway production that was advertised as not the Beatles, but an incredible simulation. Uh, London Calling was recorded at London's legendary Wessex Studios, the same location uh, where the Sex Pistols recorded their one and only groundbreaking album. Never mind the bollocks, here's the Sex Pistols. Uh, and the Pretenders recorded their revered uh, debut album LP, among others. Guy Stevens, who uh, was a well-known figure in the British music community, produced the song and the double vinyl London Calling album, one of the greatest albums of all time, definitely in my top 20 ever. Uh, Stevens was not a part of the punk movement. Uh, he was primarily known for his work with beat and blues groups of the 60s, along with the rock acts like uh, Procol Harum and uh, Mott the Hoople. Now, Guy was only 38 when he died in 1981, just a few years after London Calling came out. Sadly, Stevens overdosed on the prescription drugs that he was taking to reduce his uh, alcohol dependency, is what I understand. Now, The Clash paid tribute to Stevens in their song, Midnight to Stevens. Uh, that was pressed as a B-side of a 12-inch Clash single in the summer of 1982. It was also included on the CD collection, Clash on Broadway, that was released in 1991. This is Guy Stevens. The formative lineup of The Clash uh, was the artistic force that brought London Calling, the track and the album, to preeminence. It was Joe Strummer, lead vocals and rhythm guitar, Mick Jones on backing vocals, lead guitar, Paul Simonon on bass and uh, backing vocals. Of course, there was the distinctive drumming of Topper Heaton, who was nicknamed Mickey the Monkey because of his resemblance to the comic strip character. Now the arrangement for London Calling was centered around a driving protest march-like pulsation with all four members playing their instruments in united defiance. The track's permeating tenacity strikes from the opening note and just rips through a relentless surge of politically charged rebellion. It was Mick Jones that conducted the song's formidable soundtrack uh, to syncopate with the rhythmic flow of Strummer's caustic vocal. The music of London Calling just pulls you out of your, your comfort zone, purposefully creating unrest, elevating the discord uh, with the, the primal cackles of Joe Strummer that he unleashed at uh, almost two minutes in, rising ever louder to two minutes, 38 seconds to two minutes, 43 seconds. <laughs> Joe was allegedly imitating the distress cry of a seagull during those climactic uh, segments of London Calling. <laughs> London Calling's daunting urgency comes to a desperate end with the simulated sound of Morse code, spelling out the universal call for help, SOS. <laughs> Mick Jones cleverly created the Morse code effect with one of his guitar pickups. To deliver his formidable lead guitar riffs on London Calling, Mick chose a Gibson ES-295. No 
This was, of course, the rare instrument that was made famous by Elvis Presley's premier guitarist, Scotty Moore. Now, Elvis was a hero to Mick and, of course, to the other three members of The Clash. The album cover for the London Calling Double album was a tribute, as many of you know, to the cover of Elvis's first album. The concept for the cover art of London Calling stems from an incident that was during a live performance by The Clash at the Palladium in New York City. Uh, that was on September 21st, uh, 1979. The Clash bassist Paul Simonon became so enraged by the venue security because uh, they were not allowing fans to stand and dance about during their performance. So he pulled a Pete Townsend and smashed the white P bass on the floor of the stage, just obliterating uh, the guitar into little pieces. So Simonon slammed his guitar at exactly 10.50 p.m. Now we know this because when he smashed his bass, the impact broke his wristwatch, and the watch hands stopped at that exact time. Very cool. The episode was captured on film by photographer Penny Smith. Uh, the band loved the photo, and they wanted to use the shot for the cover of London Calling, but Smith was uh, at first reluctant, as I understand, uh, to allow that particular photo to be used for the album cover because uh, she contended that it was too blurry. But uh, thankfully, she relented. It was an image that uncannily reflected the, the Clash's frustration and anti-establishment disillusionment heard in the music of London Calling. The image became one of the most famous album covers of the rock era. Uh, the artwork for the cover outlined, you know, around a Penny Smith uh, photograph that was actually added by Rob Lowry, who added the pink letters down the left side here uh, and the green text at the bottom to complete the homage to Elvis. The cover of London Calling was later enshrined by British culture in the form of a Royal Mail postage stamp in place of the Queen's head in 2010. The London Calling album ended up being a double four-sided record, but it wasn't supposed to be. Prior to the pressing and release of London Calling, The Clash was without management to represent them in their battles with CBS Records. Uh, the band grappled with uh, their label over the disbursements of much-needed advances to help them with mounting debt and uh, debates whether London Calling should just be a double or single album. The group was very upset at CBS over what they felt was an excessive sticker price for their previous EP, The Cost of Living. So uh, the band insisted that their next record, which was going to be London Calling, would be a double album to give their fans more music for their money. Uh, actually, the last cut on the record was Train in Vain, and it was finished so late in the game that it wasn't even listed on the album sleeve at that time. In the end, London Calling had 19 songs, including Train in Vain, as a hidden track that became one of The Clash's greatest hits. Between 1977 and 1982, The Clash released eight sides of vinyl, and the band was physically and mentally exhausted, of course. I mean, the four members were constantly battling strife within the group. That included Heaton's uh, dangerous heroin addiction, and of course, ego sparring between Joe Strummer and Mick Jones. Now, Heaton was kicked out of the band at the beginning of the Combat Rock Tour, and uh, Jones was dismissed shortly after that when he and Strummer couldn't agree on the the musical direction of The Clash. Uh, Mick Jones wanted the group to transition to synthesizers, and of course, Joe Strummer would have none of that. So while Mick Jones was assembling his next band, Big Audio Dynamite, he had a very brief stint, a lot of people don't know this, very brief stint with Dave Wakeling and Ranking Roger in general public, working with them on their debut record as a return favor to Dave. He played most of the guitar on the most notable tracks on the 1984 General Public album, All the Rage, including their biggest hit, Tenderness. By 1984, though, The Clash uh, was a shadow of its former self, with only Simonon and uh, Strummer hanging on. But even Strummer's enormous talent couldn't save uh, the once proud band. The inspiration and artistic magnetism of the group, uh, the music industry regularly billed as the only band that matters, it had virtually vanished. Clash released just one more album, Cut the Crap, in 85, with three virtually unknown newcomers joining uh, Joe Strummer and Paul Simonon, and uh, the record bombed, signaling the inevitable folding 
of one of the great bands ever, The Clash. In 2000, Strummer's childhood fascination with the BBC World Service came full circle when he was given his own show on the network called Joe Strummer's London Calling, broadcasted on the airwaves of BBC World Service. The theme of the show was that Joe Strummer playing new music that he had discovered and then sharing his passion uh, about his selections with the audience. It's a great show. Transmitters to full, all receivers to boost. This is London Calling. Joe Strummer died of heart failure in 2002. He was only 50 years old. His death uh, wasn't spread across magazine covers and widely reported on like those who have passed in the last few years. Uh, but there's no question that he was just as important as David Bowie, Tom Petty, or Prince. The Clash are one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, and I've talked about them a lot as, you know, as my kids have grown up, not even thinking about it. In fact, one of my, my proudest moments, one of my favorite moments as a father, uh, is when we were watching Stranger Things a few years back, and my son, Will, who was, well, he was probably about nine at the time, he heard the should I stare or should I go on the, the show. Yeah, okay, got it, see. Should I stay or should I go? And I remember he turned to me and he just excitedly said, hey dad, listen, it's a clash, the only band that matters. It choked me up, man. One of Joe Strummer's best lyrics is, is from a track from London Calling, the incredible Clampdown, uh, where he says, let fury have the hour, anger can be power. Do you know that you can use it? That lyric, it defines the, the anger, the aggression of punk. Joe Strummer is simply one of the most beloved and most respected artists that flourished from the British punk movement of the 70s. He was an intensely loyal activist with a humble confidence that personified his bold charisma. I mean, because of Joe Strummer, I learned never, never to surrender to the clampdown. And as he said so perfectly so many years ago, the future is unwritten. So let's go write it. And you know what they said, but well, some of it was true. Leave us a comment about Joe Strummer and The Clash, the only band that matters. What are your thoughts on London Calling, uh, the song and the album? What are your memories? What are your experiences with this extraordinary band? Let us know below. Let's have a discussion. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.